welcome everybody to the Cyber Management Alliance's webinar on designing the foundations of a secure organization. A really interesting webinar we have here today. And I'm going to introduce myself and the expert panel panelists I have on here. Um, on the left is myself, Amar, uh, very easily recognizable by the blue turban for those who know me. And for those who don't, look out for the blue turban in cybersecurity. I'm joined, really excited to be joined by David McKissick, senior systems engineer as an expert. He does work for Tripwire, but he is joining me as an expert on the foundational controls. Basically, we're going to talk about some interesting stuff here. And uh, if you have any questions, you know how to answer, ask those questions. And we're going to try to answer as many of them as possible. Um, and I am now going to go straight into the webinar. So part of my challenge, when and if you th go through my profile, for those who know me, or you can Google me, I have been a CISO, a Chief Information Security Officer, uh, many times over now. And... The headache is many a times when I visit clients, when I do my CISO job, I see that many people, many companies don't have a solid foundation. Okay, and it becomes really interesting that over time what happens is that that organization over time starts to kind of, as you can see on the, on the screen, starts to shake starts to lean over, and it gets really damaging. And many, on many occasions, it boils down, believe me, to very, very basic issues, which we are going to discuss. Uh, David is here, and I'm going to tell you a bit more. And then this final animation about the fact that many a times these controls can and do affect the organization in interesting ways. Reputation damage, uh, everyone definitely on the webinar must have heard about the general data protection uh, topic, GDPR. <clears throat> These foundations can, and in very, very, very likely, are going to affect organizations in very interesting ways. Pretty much the slide says it all. If you don't get the foundations right, and anyone who has played this game should be able to relate to that, all you have to do on many occasions, you have to pluck or pick one of these foundational controls out and hey, everything just comes tumbling down. It might look beautiful here, it doesn't, but if you're in the midst of an incident, if you're in the midst of an attack, you really know what it feels like to get your basic controls wrong. And many a times, it's, you, you tend to want to hit the head against the wall kind of issues, but it, it gets really, really interesting and on many occasions when I do forensics investigations, when I go in and when we discover why an attack happened, hey, believe me, it boils down to, right, the lack of controls. The other issue I wanted to discuss with everybody on the webinar, and obviously David is listening in and we're going to hand over to David for his expert opinion. But the other issue is there's this constant search for new technologies. It is so, so sometimes to me very irritating, but there's this constant search. You meet people and they're always looking for this new next generation stuff. Uh, <clears throat> you know, 2017 is going to be the year for artificial intelligence, uh, AI, etc., etc., etc. There's this constant search by marketing folks, and by many technologists 
who go, we have to look for something brand new, something so dynamic that's going to protect us from every possible cyber attack. And it's really sometimes very saddening, but if you think about this, this constant search for new toys, what that leads to is the complete uh, the people missing the point on the basics. The basics are missed. This image here, really colorful, trying to get the message across that instead of looking for new toys, what we really, really need to do is need to focus and focus our energies on, I'm going to say the basics, but I'll tell you right now, we need to stop making basics sound boring. We need to, rather than making them the icing on the cake, cake looks really lovely for those who are looking at this. Um, and and this, uh, this live webinar is also being recorded for those who want to look at it later. Foundational controls are not icing on the cake, folks. Get this message home. Talk to your managers, whoever you need to talk to. Foundational controls are not icing on the cake. Please repeat after me. I know, but we've got to move on. But they are not and should not be icing on the cake. And neither should financial foundational controls. I was going to say financial controls. Foundational controls should not be part of a shopping list of, hey, we are reaching the end of the budget year. What do we need to buy? Oh, let's buy. Well, we need to close the budget, so let's buy some foundational controls technologies. That is really, really the wrong way to approach this major issue of defending your organization, defending the business against cyber attacks. And I repeat this. I know I'm, I'm not doing this on purpose, but I'll tell you why. Missing the foundational controls element is a perfect recipe for getting it wrong and getting the regulators chasing you, especially from May 2018 onwards. If you get these wrong, if you look at it as a shopping list of stuff that you need to get to tick the box exercise, the GDPR is really going to be very punitive for most organizations. Finally, foundational controls really should not be, you know, left to your dog to buy. You know what I'm trying to say, okay? And the point is, I'm driving this message home as much as I can. It's not child's play. We're calling them basic controls. Some people call them going back to the basics. Uh, I tell you, you, they are not basic controls. They are essential controls. They are the foundational controls of building a secure organization. Okay, David, who is joining me uh, very soon, I'm going to hand over to David McKissick from Tripwire. He is the expert on here. He's going to discuss some of the controls in detail. But the key message here from a CISO, and I've done this many times, and I keep doing this for many organizations, this is not child's play. You know, having the foundational controls that David is going to discuss is not basic stuff. It may not be sexy for those who are listening in, and I've got a couple of people saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of them, it's good to see some of you agree, right? They are not basic controls. They are foundational, essential controls, okay? And every client I visit, yeah, these are some of the most important things we discuss. And many, many people go, yeah, you know, but we've got this really cool next generation stuff. Oh, and we've got a new device that does artificial intelligence. Yeah, but if you don't have your foundations right, guess what? Going back to that beautiful game you were playing, if you put your foundational control controls metaphorically right at the top of your, your building, hey, it's going to be a pile of dust or a pile of bricks or jengas. On the left, you really, really want to make sure you get your foundational controls right at the beginning of your project, of your transformation project, of your endeavors to make sure your business does not get easily hacked. Okay, we are going to all get compromised sooner or later. That's the reality. 
But getting the foundations right is one sure way to ensure that it's a major deterrent to most cyber criminals so that they can go and try others who have put the foundational controls right at the top of their building. Okay, so I'm going to now, uh, before I hand over to David, the other thing I do want to say is another image I wanted to present everyone. If this was a big, bad cyber criminal, the elephant that we have there, okay, could not find the really big elephant for some reason, so I use a normal sized elephant. <laughs> um, the reality is that big, bad cyber criminals find so the essential controls really, really irritating, okay? And many times they get scared of them because they can't, the essential controls, if implemented and deployed correctly, can be a major deterrent for the big, open quotes, bad cyber criminals. Yeah? Cannot stress with you more. I'm going to hand over soon to David for his expert opinion. And David is going to give you a bit more in-depth opinion. And then we'll go into the questions. There are several questions coming in. I see at least three good questions. I need at least four or five more good questions coming in, so please let them. And David's going to take over very soon. David McKissick from Tripwire. So I'm going to give him control, and I'm going to let him use his presentation. So please bear with me. David, over to you. David McKissick from Tripwire. Brilliant. Thank you, Amar. So I want to start by talking about what is meant by foundational controls? How and why do they form the core elements of your security architecture? End user environments are complex. Many kinds of assets and devices, file servers, workstations, applications, virtual systems, databases, network devices, so much more, residing both on premise and in the cloud. With all these systems running on different OSs and versions, the level of exposure is greatly increased. This creates targets of opportunity for those who would damage organizations by stealing confidential information or bringing down networks. Let's not forget, it was only in October 2016 that Dyn, a company that controls much of the internet DNS infrastructure, was targeted in a DDoS attack using the Murai botnet that itself was using IoT devices, so Internet of Things devices. 2016, massive year of security breaches with many global organizations coming forward and acknowledging data breach, breaches. So close to home in the UK, we've got Tesco Bank and 3Mobile. They both had customer data stolen by hackers. Not only a monetary value associated with this in terms of compensation to customers, but it severely damages the reputation of the business and also provides a legal liability. To combat the ever-growing security threats, the UK government earlier this year announced it was investing £1.9 billion over the next five years to help protect Britain from cyber attacks. So whilst we can only speculate on the exact methods and hacking techniques involved in many cyber attacks, one thing we can deduce is that by implementing foundational controls, it will be simpler to detect, remediate a breach, and then harden systems to help prevent subsequent attacks. Foundational controls are fundamental and provide the backbone to a successful IT security strategy. At times, too much emphasis is placed on primitive controls and the latest up-and-coming vendors promising to stop zero-day attacks and APTs, so advanced persistent threats, and Amar's already touched upon this. But internal employees represent the largest threat to an organization. So whilst perimeter controls are crucial, equal importance should also be placed on knowing what assets are on your network. What applications are on those assets? any vulnerabilities present, and then having sufficient capabilities to monitor logs 24 by 7. It's now a fact of not if there's going to breach, but when. 
or we can essentially break cybersecurity foundations down into four pillars. Discovery, so actively managing, so inventory, track and correct all network devices on the network and create a list of authorized software and version that is required in the enterprise for each type of system, including servers, workstations and laptops. You've got best practices. Establish a standard secure configurations of your OSs and software applications. Standardized images should represent hardened versions of the underlying OS and the application installed on the system. So these images should be validated and refreshed on a regular basis to make sure the security configuration uh, in light of recent vulnerabilities and attack vectors. Thirdly, we've got risk assessment. So do you run automated vulnerability scanning tools against all systems on the network on a weekly or more frequent basis? Deliver prioritized lists of the most critical vulnerabilities to each responsible system admin along with risk scores that compare the effectiveness of system admins and departments in reducing risk. If you don't, then you're at risk. Then finally, monitoring. Do you leverage all available logs to detect, assess, and monitor what's taking place inside your network and on your, on your devices? Do you know what's taking place in your critical infrastructure 24 by 7? So if you're looking for an example of an industry standard set of foundation controls, you can start with the CIS critical security controls. These were initially developed in 2008 by the SANS Institute before being transferred to the Center for Internet Security, to CIS for short, in 2015. These best practices consist of 20 actions called CSC that organization, organizations should adopt to help block or mitigate attacks. Data suggests that by implementing the first five CIS controls, you can reduce the risk of cyber attack by roughly around 85%. By implementing all 20 controls, this risk reduction becomes about 94%. Sorry, Sorry. David, I'm going to interrupt you here. I apologize. Um, I can definitely vouch for that from my experience as a CISO that even the five controls that you're seeing on your screen now, which David is going to deep dive a bit more, but as a CISO, if you can get even the basic five controls 50% uh, right, you are really doing very well. Uh, as you know, if you go back to that image, for those who are listening from the beginning of that elephant, cyber criminals do not like these controls, full stop. Sorry, David, just wanted to reinforce. No, no, thank you, Omar. <clears throat> so what we're essentially saying is that if you implement a strong foundation, you adhere to the first just stable and effective platform to build on. So as we've already discussed, you need a good, solid foundation for your security program. And Tripwire provides you with proven solutions for the security controls that are essential to any good security program. So let's look at these foundational controls in a little bit more detail. So firstly, we're going to start with endpoint discovery. So essentially, knowing what's on your network. So researchers and analysts predict that come 2020, Internet connected devices will exceed anything between 20 and 50 billion. Now, that number uh, may seem a bit high to some people, but this is what the analysts are predicting. These devices are getting more dynamic. So, with virtual machines getting spun up, spun down, devices connected to different networks, IP addresses changing. All these changes make it difficult to monitor and protect endpoints as they appear and disappear from the network. When you're not able to monitor these dynamic endpoints, we're constrained by limited visibility. So it's important to have visibility on the device on your network because what you can't manage, what you can't see. If you don't know what devices should be on the network, it would be very difficult to identify the devices that shouldn't be on the network. It's also important to identify 
identify devices so you can monitor them. If they're not monitored, the ability to protect them and prove compliance is therefore limited. David, can I, can I again just yes. share my experience? Yeah, please do, Mama, yes. uh, thank you. So for those listening in, it's really critical to understand why this is so important. And I've been on the receiving end in terms of where I've done CISO gigs for organizations. Many, many times it's the unknown asset the unknown system that has been left over by someone who, good intentions, don't get me wrong, folks, very good intentions, wanted to do the right thing, set up a system, no one knew about it, okay, and it got compromised. Now, David mentioned, David, you mentioned IoT, right? If organizations are not able to get on top of assets and discovery today, imagine the challenges of getting discovery correct when a small 5,000 company organization has millions of IoT devices that they have to be aware of. It is so crucial. I hope you agree. You, I mean, you agree, David. I hope the people listening in can take this key message, discovery is such a crucial element of a control. Yep. You know? Exactly, exactly that. So there's a massive expansion in the number of devices and apps installed on these devices, and they represent an expanding attack surface, essentially. Uh, so that may include unlicensed software, unneeded software, services that are out of date, and unpatched devices. They're all out there. You need to know where this stuff is so you can protect it, if you can't protect it at the very least, then you can turn it off if you don't need it. So, step two, secure configurations. The vast majority of devices are insecure by default. Um, we can't rely on end users to reconfigure devices. They don't have the experience. It's not their job, etc., etc. Secure configurations can help you harden devices by using secure settings and then you baseline those systems to identify a known good state. Since security configurations are known, we can also use them to detect changes and understand why a change is good or bad. So knowing if a change is good or bad helps distinguish between business as usual and a security breach. It's hard to make those distinctions when we don't have details of the change. So what's exactly changed, when did it change, who's changed it? When something bad does change, how do you know how to get back to its desired state? It can take time, precious resources to undo a bad change, or even track down the steps that need to be taken to get the device back to a good state. And crucially, this is a time when an attacker can take advantage. Which brings us nicely onto vulnerability uh, management. It is unfortunate Vulnerabilities are a fact of life. Unpatched devices and software are an open door for attackers. We all know this. But for many organizations, there are too many vulnerabilities and not enough people to fix them all. You can't patch everything. It's, it's impossible. It's important to fix the biggest risks first, so you need to prioritize. But it's hard to know what to fix first. How do you prioritize vulnerability risk so that you invest your valuable human resources in the places they're needed most. One way to do this is to look at the potential impact of a, of a successful attack, ask yourself these questions. How much damage will they do? How important is the target to the business? Attackers also deal with limited resources. So just like us, they're using automa automation and going after quick wins. Amar's already touched upon that with the big bad cyber criminals. Um, if you can figure out what vulnerabilities an attacker is going to hit your network with, then you can focus on fixing those vulnerabilities first. So an example, if a vulnerability is detected by an exploit kit, it's going to be far easier to exploit that vulnerability, so it becomes a higher priority. Sorry, David, can I also interrupt on that particular? You can, mm, uh, of course. It's, Click back. Yep. No, no, that's fine. Thank you. Um, 
it's really crucial to, to understand why this is an, a really important control. Um, and I'm being, you know, again, totally upfront here. Many people think, oh, vulnerability assessment is boring. It's a dead end job. Actually, I myself, and I know many, many uh, good, good hackers who have learned a lot from vulnerability, you know, the knowledge of vulnerabilities. Um, if you understand why an a automated tool is showing you a vulnerability, um, first of all, you need to know your asset, obviously, right? So, uh, you know, if you're good in discovery and then you keep, you're on top of discovering the vulnerabilities on those assets, um, you're far ahead of the game. And there's quite a lot for those listening in, folks, there's quite a lot you can learn um, when an automated tool uh, discovers something for you, you know, the objective is not just to go, yeah, okay, found thousand discover, you know, vulnerabilities. That tool obviously is going to give you some priorities. But then what I recommend is you use that as a learning ex exercise to go, so right, a vulnerability has been discovered on an asset. How would a cyber criminal exploit that vulnerability, as you rightly point out, Dave? All right, David? Go on. Yeah, I, I, I think what's also interesting, Amar, if, if, if you look back at some of the data breaches that we've heard about recently, it's very unusual that they're actually targeted by some zero-day attack or APT. The major majority of breaches yeah. come yeah. from known vulnerabilities exactly. which haven't been patched. So repeat that and, again. And, and, Just repeat that again fully. Yeah. Go on. Yeah, so yeah, it, it, it's frightening that attackers are still getting in via known vulnerabilities. It's not always this fancy APT. It's not always a zero-day attack. It's not always a nation state. It, it, it's a known vulnerability, and, that, and that's the crazy thing about a And that is such a crucial well. point you make, David, because uh, wrongly, folks listening in, please pay attention, right, guys and girls. Media, the media always plays, oh, sophisticated attack, you know, nation state, really super duper uh, talented. However, to stress what David is saying, I'm going to repeat that, folks, many, many times. And this is not challenging anybody's intellect in terms of cyber criminals intellect, but many times people are exploiting known vulnerabilities that exist for long, long times. So it cannot be stressed further if there is, which is why we call these really foundational essential controls. If you do want to go out and buy something really funky and next generation, before you spend your money, take a bit of time and go, am I on top of discovery? Am I on top of vulnerability assessment? And then think about something else that you want to uh, focus on. Sorry, David, go on, over to you. Yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> last but my no means least, say so log management. Um, Logging is important for detection, investigative incidents, um, but we've all worked in sysadmin roles. Logs get turned off, deleted, manipulated. It's important to make sure logging is turned on and stays on. But logging can create a lot of information, sometimes too much information and too many alerts. Um, you need someone to actually look at all this data, and that's a difficult thing. Aggregation, correlation can help here. It can also reduce the events per second if you're forwarding events to a same solution. Without logging, it can be difficult to find and respond to suspicious events uh, and uncover what went wrong. Manual responses can be delayed when the appropriate information isn't easily available because logging's been turned off or because the log data is difficult to filter and analyze. So again, we've, we've all been there. You see loads of alerts come through, but you can't see the wood for the trees. This is where an effective logging system really comes in handy. So to summarize everything, the key to dealing with this risk is to remember foundational controls still apply, so regardless of scale. Know what's on your network, understand how it's vulnerable, keep it patched, keep it securely configured, and monitor for suspicious activity. So, to 
just in one sentence, quite simply, do the easy things well, and the hard things will be easier. So, David, I'm going to stay on log management for a few minutes, if you don't mind. Um, of course, yeah. Many a times what happens, and this is, again, the key message for log management, in my opinion, and I hope you agree, David, is visibility. Yeah? Yep. Oh, you definitely. You need that visibility to understand what is happening within your organizational systems. Okay? And I'm not going to say blind, actually, but I'm going to say if you are not on top of log management, you are going to be oblivious to a potential attacker, a cyber criminal, etc., within your network. Because there's one thing which David touched upon, folks, which is really crucial to remember. APT, APT people have said that many times, but there's one thing which is really, really important with modern cyber attacks, right? And we've know, everyone hopefully knows about the cyber kill chain. The one really key crucial element about cyber attacks is the persistence element, okay? Many, many attacks are very, or cyber criminal, right? Okay, and I, I've, I've talked to many hackers. I used to do ethical hacking myself. Today, the primary objective of a cyber criminal is persistence. They want to stay within your network as long as possible because motivations are no longer uh, to destroy data in many cases, but persistence allows observation. Um, for those listening in, if you have some time, go and do some research on Carbonac. That's C-A-R-B-A-N-A-K, Carbonac. Okay, and any modern APT, there is one key element here, which is how does a cyber criminal become persistent within your network? And if he or she can achieve persistence, if that malware, ransomware, whatever you want to call it, can achieve persistence, it's totally counterproductive and negative to your organization, okay? I cannot stress this enough. Yeah. And and why did David, enough. sorry, go on, David, sorry. No, I, I, I'm, I'm complete agreement with you, Ma. I'm com complete yeah. agreement. And what I was going to say was why David is stressing on log management is because if you can, and I know, again, it goes back to the whole issue, David. The problem is, right, in fact, log management is probably last on anyone's budget because it's boring. It's tier. It's considered a tier two or tier three service, yep. right? Um, and spending a lot of money on log management or SIEM is the last thing that anyone wants, okay? But, but th for those of you listening in, pay, pay attention to this because, and I'm going to bring GDPR up again. I'll tell you why. If you are oblivious, okay, if you don't have logging, if you're not logging as much as possible, apart from the fact that you're going to be oblivious and, you know, the, a, a cyber criminal is going to be able to, open quotes, hide in your network close, a, the fact is if and when, or rather when you do get breached, not if, you are not going to be able to stand up in front of regulators and tell them, hey, this is what happened. Because you don't have, you're not going to have access to any data to tell the regulators, to tell your customers a story. Because How are you going to stand up and say to your customers, we know exactly what happened? Because you can't do that if you are not logging. And if you don't have visibility in your end devices, in your servers, in your IoT devices that you're going to have, and this message needs to be put forward to management for those who are listening in is ask your management when the time comes and the time is very near. You know, we're in 2017 now, May 2018 is not that far away. Brexit or no Brexit for those listening in from London, England or UK, Brexit or no Brexit, regulations are going to change. Notification, breach notification is going to become a business imperative 
the question you must and your, your senior folks must ask themselves, you know, when the proverbial hits the fan, are they going to be able to stand up in front of their customers um, and or the regulators and tell them, yeah, you know what, we know exactly what happened. If they don't have logging for everything, um, and if they're not collecting it in one location, if they're not, you know, don't have a proper working SIEM, they're going to have to go to the regulators and think about what they're going to say. Um, sorry, we don't know really exactly. We don't know anything what happened. We did get compromised, and the newspapers told us about it, but we have no clue how the attackers succeeded. So you can put these two scenarios in front of your management and ask them which one they prefer. So out of all of these, you know, essential controls, people consider log management really boring and uh, inefficient. I cannot stress how important ensuring. And the other thing, you know, I, I think, David, obviously you agree. Um, the other thing on the log management side is you need to check what you are logging. We are talking about security events. Correct, David? Yeah. I, I was about to say exactly the same thing. So what's interesting for me is that every device out there on your network will log to something, like SNMP, syslog, whatever that may be. You can send it to a seam. You need to make sure that you are collating the information correctly because you could easily miss some critical information. If, if someone's in your network making changes, you need to be able to find that information effectively. It's all going well sending everything to a seam, but if you're not filtering inform information out, if you're not correlating uh, what's available to you, you're just going to miss it. And repeating ourselves again, in come May 2018, you cannot notify the regulators if you don't know that you've been breached. And that itself is going to cost you a significant amount of money, right? And for those people who are listening in from other countries, I can almost bet my bottom dollar here. Sooner or later, every country on the planet Earth, that is, that we live on, is going to have some form of breach notification laws. And essential controls, especially log management, having some kind of an SIEM or SIEM, uh, knowing what you want out of that seam is so crucial to be able to deal with regulations. So it's actually a compliance issue, folks. Okay. And if you have 5,000 devices and you're only logging from 100 devices, good luck. You are oblivious. Yeah. And your persistent threat is going to be laughing all the way to the bank. <laughs> right. Okay. So. A couple of questions, David. I think uh, we need many, many of them coming in, but some really good ones. Okay. One of them says, are you saying we should not focus on the other 15 CSC or CIS controls? Okay. okay. Good question. Um, no is a simple answer to that. Um, the top five are critical. The other 15 controls are, are, are very important. What we are saying, though, is that by implementing the first five, you can drastically reduce your threat exposure. Um, so understanding what's on the network, devices, software, where the vulnerabilities are. Um, as I've touched upon earlier, I um, mentioned it already, the vast majority of threats that we're seeing are known vulnerabilities. Um, that's still a major issue. Let's not forget, though, uh, these controls, they, they don't just help protect against threats coming in from external sources, um, very briefly mentioned inside a threat, uh, but inside a threat, how disgruntled employees, very much a, a risk to organisation as nation states, political activists, uh, so you need controls around data protection, access controls, these are all vital. Um, <laughs> I know we're banging the drum here, but these foundational controls, it's essentially like building a house, isn't it? If you build weak foundations for your house, anything you build on top is essentially going to fall apart over time. So, no, totally. And I'm going to bang my desk. Foundational <laughs> controls. No, I'm serious about this, right? And I mean, it's a good question. Are you saying we should not focus? Just to repeat that question, are you saying we should not focus on the other controls? 
Uh, I don't think David or I or anybody else is saying that. Okay, you need the other 15. You need the other, I don't know, 100 odd controls that they are in ISO 27001, PCI, etc. Right? You need all good controls. However, and what we are saying this, and you know, many other governments are starting to say this. Many other other professionals are saying similar things. Is you need to get these basics. I know basics is wrong. Sometimes people go, you're simplifying these. I agree, which is why we're saying foundational essential controls okay if you don't have these essential ones i mean listen if you have all the budget on the planet number one i envy you good luck <laughs> you're really lucky you can implement every control right i mean david is an expert he's worked on you know different technologies there is no shortage of technologies out there but it goes back to if you had an option and you had limited budget and you have 20 controls, what David and I are saying is, folks, focus on the essential five, okay? Discovery, privileged management, secure configurations, vulnerability ass assessment, log management, okay? Don't ignore log management. I know many do the others. Log management is often ignored. Log management is so crucial. Thank you, David. Another one that's coming. Actually, we've got some yep. good questions. Is there a specific order to implement these controls? Is there a specific hmm. order? Oh, that's a good question. Is there yeah, a specific I, order to I, I wouldn't say that, I wouldn't say there's an order as such. Um, but I think it, it, it sort of goes without saying that controls one and two come first. Um, so you need to understand what hardware and software, software on the network. Um, so wait, once you know, what, sorry, can I? Just yeah, of course, please do. do. So yeah. which one? Once you sort of once you've established what's on the network, um, you can then start seeing what vulnerabilities are available, implementing secure configurations. So I, I, I think a, a simple answer, no, I don't think there's a specific order. I, I think they all sort of just come about naturally once you know what's on your network. That, that, that's key yeah. to all this, yeah. knowing what's on your network. Once you know what's on your network, you can then look to protect what's on the network. You can't protect what you don't know about, essentially. Totally. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say I agree. and I mean, It's a good question. Is there a specific order? Because... Um, People like to do things in structured ways. I think one of the things, and I know this has been, again, it's a cliche that you have heard a hundred times, but you need to understand what are the top risks that you are facing. Um, I, if, if, is everyone ready for this? You need to take a risk-based approach. You must have heard it a hundred times, folks, but I tell you, it is so crucial again. If you don't know what you're protecting, uh, you may not be able to take a risk-based approach Hence, you may implement all of these controls, but not understand which asset is the most important, right? So, yes, I agree with David, but what I would also add to that is once you know uh, you're on top of discovery, start identifying your key assets, what's important, what's not, and then start focusing in that particular order. Yeah? Hope you agree, David. Oh, completely, completely agree. Next, I like David. He agrees with me. <laughs> <laughs> next question. Um, next question. Is this approach specific to any organization of any size? Another good question. David, is, is. this approach specific is. to any organization of any size? Definitely. Definitely. So every organization... Every organization needs to know what's on their network. Um, you could argue it's easier for a small company to know what assets are on the network than a global company. Um, but then if you flip that around, it's easier for smaller organizations, and this is my opinion, um, it's the smaller organizations that will say, right, we've got 500 assets on our network, however, I trust you workers, here's the administrator rights to your laptop. Go and install some software if you want. Um, 
I find that enterprise organizations don't have that approach. They may not know exactly what's on their network because there are so many employees, but they will have they won't be so forthcoming with those sort of privileges. Um, it's a misconception as well, I think, that large companies have more intellectual data than a smaller company. Um, so plenty of smaller companies, so if we look at sub-1,000 employees, they have very sensitive information. Um, so if we look at law firms, for example, plenty of law firms are under 1,000 employees. The information they hold is critical. If that information did get out, it would be a major embarrassment to that organisation. On the, again, on the flip side, an organisation with 100,000 employees, they may not have so much sense of information as, as much as, as, as a law firm. So, again, is it sp specific to any organisation of any size? Yes, yes. Foundation of Control is exactly that. They are the basis of of a security architecture. Every so what, organization needs to be aware of them. So, sorry, David. One more question just popped in again. Uh, this one is, should we be running discovery constantly? I, I have my thoughts. What do you think? As in a constant yes. discovery, constantly, you know. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Again, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. If, if you know what's on the network, you can start implementing rules, secure configurations to be able to protect that information. Um, if you're not doing that constant discovery, then that gives the attacker the, the, the potentially the foothold to get into the network. Now, we, you need to trade that, that discovery off with network traffic and administration, but wherever possible, yes, you need to be doing that constant discovery. Um, it's unfortunate that's the world we live in nowadays, but you need to know what's on that on that network that you manage. You need okay. to control those assets. You need to control the software. No, I agree. Um, as we've discussed many times, discovery is really important. So if you're not running it every day, you might as well not run discovery. Uh, yeah. To be totally blunt, many, 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 uh, if you're using the cloud, um, you know, assets may appear for one hour, for five hours. So if you're not constantly monitoring stuff, you may not know actually what hit you, okay? And hence, this is the reason why you really need to encourage constant discovery of assets, full stop. Next question. Uh, so we've covered a few others. There's another one here. If these controls are so important, why do businesses still ignore them? Interesting. If these controls are so important, why are still businesses actually not implementing these controls? David. That's the best, que that's the best question so far. <laughs> um, so I don't think they're ignored. Um, I, I, I think every CISO, CTO, administrator, they'd love to know what's on their network. Um, I, I think with a lot of mature companies, um, it's a lot of work to undertake. So rather than look implementing foundational controls, they're looking at technologies that prevent and block. Um, the segmented networks are potentially a big concern. Um, it's harder to scan. Um, managed by different teams, so that could be one factor. Um, BYOD. Yeah. Uh, we haven't even mentioned BYOD yet. So. <laughs> Major challenge, major challenge. Um, one of the big issues you've got with BYOD is that you as the organization, you don't manage those devices. They are user devices. So how do you monitor those? Very, very difficult. Um, oh, what else have you got? Shadow IT, so users installing applications on their, on their work devices, which you have no idea about, a major concern. Um, yeah, and as a, as Amar said at the very start, too much emphasis is placed on sort of like new technology. Um, I'm sure everyone listening to this, both live and eventually recorded, we've all walked through the trade shows, InfoSec being the big one, and you see the big flashing lights and all about stopping threats and managing the Internet of Things. Um, I think people get taken in by the hype. So these foundational controls sort of get, get ignored or pushed to the bottom. Um, yeah. 
totally. And you that's, know what? That's, that's my that's my take on it. No, totally, David. And just to stress, the bigger the organization, the larger the organization. Uh, obviously, there are more people, and everyone's again then looking for the panacea, right? The new toy. Yeah. Um, as you saw earlier in my uh, presentation, right? The shiny new colorful toys is what people yeah. think are suddenly going to be able to protect them. Um, a lot of the times, and let's put it out there, many senior executives go for jollies and they discover, hey, I've just bought this really cool next generation stuff. And then they come back and go to their CISO or their uh, head of IT and go, I need this cool toy because it's going to suddenly protect us. Yeah. One key message exactly. or, or one more key message all of you can take away is there is no protection. There is deterrence and then there is the question of can you detect and respond? This whole ideology and this whole this whole human concept of we can be protected against cyber attacks needs to be done away with in my opinion. Only yeah. then actually can your executives and, and organization start to go, yeah, you know what, now that we definitely cannot be protected 100%, what can we do to ensure that the hackers, or the, excuse me, I don't like, because hackers can be good, the cyber criminals go and, you know, target uh, whoever can run faster than the other, I guess. Okay, <clears throat> we're running out a bit of time, so there's another two or three more I'm going to address. Is there one control that we absolutely must implement and if there is, which one would it be? <laughs> I, think, I, think, I, I, think we, I think we know that uh, from, from your point of view, our log management is, uh, is, is critical. Um, for me personally, I wouldn't necessarily put one above the other in terms of importance. Um, they all provide a link to each other. Um, you could argue that by implementing CSC4, which is vulnerability assessment, you're constantly trying to plug those gaps. Um, and then you could easily argue that by implementing a rigid structure around admin privileges, um, you've got to make sure that programs, malicious uh, content isn't run by users logging in as administrator. But then you can easily say that log management is key, so you can start uh, determining where these uh, sort of attackers are getting in, how to mediate. Um, I think once you start tracking devices and software, it, it, it's a relatively natural progression to then start hardening those systems and, and, and applying the relevant controls. That's sort of my my feeling on that one. What do you think, Amar? Would you agree? Yeah, so um, if there's one control, we absolutely... And I, I think this question, whoever's asked this question, my apologies, I'm not going to name them. Um, I think it's the wrong question. I tell you why, because this this is that mentality that I was referring to earlier. Um, uh, David, I know I put you on the spot with this question, but, you know, <laughs> um, I had some time to think about it. <laughs> um, uh, this question is wrong because this is the kind of question, you know, that goes back to, oh, is there one thing that can protect us? Um, and that's why I think it's the wrong question because you have to take a balanced approach no control is ever going to protect you. Yes, many of these essential foundational controls are going to increase your your re resiliency. Um, cyber criminals are most likely going to go away uh, because you have these controls implemented correctly. But there's not one control to rule them all. I'm sorry, all the Lord of the Ring fans, there is no one control to rule any other control. They all need to, you, I'm going to say that again, you have to understand the risks, the threat actors, the threats, and then take a sensible, pragmatic approach. But the point that David and I are trying to drive home today is you need to consider as a bare minimum, I often spell it B-E-A-R, that's wrong, uh, <laughs> B-A-R-E minimum, you need to consider essential controls as part of your kind of, again, skeletal strategy to ensure you're doing the right things. Okay, so I'm going to, we have to now uh, kind of call it a day. Uh, and I'm going to say ransomware is a major threat. The last question. Oh, good old ransomware. We have to do the ransomware one. <laughs> yeah. Ransomware is no. a major threat. Do these controls help again ransomware? A quick answer and then. 
we carry on. David, over to you. Yeah, so so, so very quick. Um, it, it can't stop it, but it, it can help. Um, it can help remediate ransomware. So essentially, if we look at control number two, so software management, um, yes, you can use that foundational control to detect malicious code coming in, as can control number five, so administrative controls. So again, as I touched upon the last question, making sure that users aren't using administrative uh, privileges on their laptop to run that malicious code. Um, so if, if you look further down the list of the, of the 20 CSC controls, you can start building on top of the foundation. So very quickly, email and web browser protection, malware defense, data recovery capability, all, all key tools in helping the fight against ransomware. So that was <laughs> very quick response from me on ransomware because I know we're running out of time. So no, um, no, I appreciate that. I think to add to that, as you as we discussed earlier, one of the essential controls is change, config, uh, understanding what's changed, right? So um, being able to detect what's changed um, mm -hmm. and ransomware is going to change stuff. Malware is going to change stuff. Um, ransomware, yes, I think all of these controls as we've discussed many times, um, yes, you need to uh, educate the humans about not being conned into clicking something that's going to suddenly, you know, clean their computer of a virus that doesn't exist. But all of these controls in unison are definitely going to increase your resilience against any kind of attack. I think one one thing that comes up is obviously whitelisting apps, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's many other things you can do, but as we said earlier, skeletal strategy. There is no one control to rule them all. You have to consider essential controls and the other 15 to basically make it really more difficult for cyber criminals to compromise you. So uh, apologies to the other questions. I do apologize. I, I wanted to thank David McKissick from Tripwire and everybody else who made it here. For those who are going to look at the recorded sessions after we finish this live one, you can still get in touch with us uh, for any other questions. Um, otherwise, just keep backing, uh, checking rather, not keep checking back in for other uh, Cyber Management Alliance webinars. David, many thanks. Thank you, Marches.